Hello and welcome to the Jumpstart Podcast with Jeff Lytix. I'm your host, Jeff Sauer. Today, for our 10th episode, we'll talk with Darren Shaw, local SEO expert and founder of WhiteSpark. I'm recording this intro from San Francisco, where I'm currently visiting my previous home during my U.S. homecoming tour. Darren and I chatted a few weeks ago back when I was teaching in Minneapolis, and both of us were lamenting the early snowfall that came out the window. You see, Darren is from the only place that I know that's colder than my native Minnesota. He's from Edmonton, Alberta, and Canada. When I first met Darren, I wanted to show off my world geography knowledge. So he said he was from Edmonton, and I said, I hear it's beautiful there. He quickly corrected me. You're thinking of Calgary, is what he said. There's nothing in Edmonton. Well, nothing other than oil and giant malls. So after that, I was pretty surprised that I hit it off so quickly with Darren because I was really skeptical about him at first, but not for a very good reason. You see, everybody talks about how much they love Darren Shaw and they have a point of love and admiration. Nobody had anything to bad to say, only good things about Darren Shaw. And that immediately made me suspicious. Obviously, I thought he was hiding something. So, But it only took me about two pints of beer to realize that Darren was the real deal. Genuine, humble, likable, and a pretty solid arm wrestler. Arm wrestler? I know what you're thinking. This is a marketing podcast. Well, it's not all PowerPoints and buzzwords. Sometimes I like to flex my muscle in other ways. I'll let you know that story at the end of the podcast. But first, I wanted to give a word from our unofficial sponsor, Evernote. I've been using Evernote for the past six or seven years, and it's probably the one app that I couldn't live without. It started as a simple note-taking app for me, but then I quickly started using it to scan business cards, use voice dictation, and share notes between friends and family. My favorite part about Evernote is that the founder has gone on the record to claim that he wanted to build a 100-year company. No gimmicks, just a solid foundation for the future. How awesome is that? Go to jefflix.com slash Evernote to find out what all the fuss is about. Now, let's get to Darren Shaw. Darren is a pillar of the local SEO community. Learn what local SEO is, how Darren got into it, and how he developed a suite of tools that is now deemed vital for any small business trying to rank in local search engines. Go to jefflytics.com slash Darren for show notes and other resources. Okay, we're here today with Darren Shaw. Darren, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about your story and, and your journey into becoming one of the world-leading local search marketers. And so let's talk about it. And the uh, first question I have for you is, when did you realize that you were passionate about the world of marketing? What, what was the first win that you had that made you realize this is something that might be a career choice for me? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I've had that one before. And I, I know exactly the moment. We were working with a big e-commerce site. Not big, but they were a local business that had an e-commerce site. And they were doing pretty decently for back in the day and they were it was a big portion of the revenue and we looked at their website and it was one of these situations where the business itself was really well loved and so they had a lot of links already a lot of media mentions and their website just had zero optimization so we did some structural changes on the site and uh, we built category pages for each of their uh, retail categories we optimized the title tags added a bunch of content and Literally within one month, we tripled their revenue from their site. It was crazy. Wow. We made them millions more money. And so <laughs> I was like, this is amazing. And so I wanted to do a lot more of it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really a pretty nice success story there to be able to generate millions of dollars and to see it immediately happen. And it doesn't take much to get to that point. So yeah. how did you, when you say we, that's that's what I want to get to is like, you say we, were you on a job at this point? Where was this in your career? Was this towards the beginning? How did you get to this point where you were able to have somebody trust you to optimize their website? Actually, I should have just said I in that situation because yeah. at that time I was I was mostly just a one man show. That was when I was just a freelance web developer. Okay. Yeah. And, and it, was, so did, it was Moz. It was, that was around 2007 when I was really into the Moz community and, and mm -hmm. so... I guess I just learned about SEO through Moz and did all those tricks on that one website that I was working on, and uh, it, it just killed it for him. So it was nice. at the time it was it was still White Spark, but it, at that time it was mostly just me. Okay, and so let's go back to the what was your education then? How did you get into becoming a web developer? Was that something you went to school for? Is that something you went to college for? Or did you just learn it on the on your own? Yeah, I did go to school. So I went to university with the intention of getting a computer science degree. And I spent my first three years of university just 
the way it works is you have to apply to general university sciences classes and then you take all these computing classes and based on your marks in those computing classes you get into the department of computing science and eventually you get a computing science degree and so year after year i would take computing courses and try to get my marks to the right level so i could get into the department but i was a terrible student so one of the reasons why i didn't do so well is because i was spent so much time in the lab fiddling around with websites so i started building my own website and i really just got obsessed with html and javascript and like I can remember spending hours making like silly little JavaScript sliders and that kind of stuff way back in. Yep. That would have been 2000, 2000, mm -hmm. actually 1998 back in. Yeah, it was, it was that long ago. So I was really uh, into the web stuff uh, back then. And yeah. then I did take a lot of computing courses and I did quite well in anything that was programming. But then anything that was math or theory, I did really bad. And so... Unfortunately, that tipped the scales the wrong way, and I, I got kicked out of sciences because my marks were so bad. But I was a, at the time, my job was a network administrator for the Faculty of Arts, and I was fixing the Dean of Arts computer, and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I just got kicked out of university. And he was like, oh, that's terrible. Well, why don't you write me a letter, and I'll, you can come and take something at arts. And so I did. I wrote a letter, and, and he let me into the, the Faculty of Arts, and I now have an anthropology degree. So that was, that's kind of how that worked. Yeah, so that's cool. So you were just tinkering around with it and realizing that, just to give you my history, I, I had a computer science degree and we pretty much went to school around the same time. And when I went through it, I realized that the web was more exciting to me than just writing programs or doing desktop programs. Yet yeah. the curriculum didn't really catch up with that. And so that's what a lot of us had to do was just tinker around with animations and Flash and JavaScript and stuff like that just to sort of get that curiosity going. And then you sort of you know, the school doesn't really catch up with it. So you have to go and do it on your own, really. Yeah, that was exactly the situation. There were no courses for this. You know, the closest yeah. thing was Java. You could take some Java courses and then you can make applets for the web. Mm -hmm. But that was the closest thing that they ever taught in school. Yeah, yep, yep. That's exactly the same for me, too. So then it sounds like you went through this and, and you graduated from school. But then did the curiosity for making websites, is that something that you just went to do right away? Or did you have to get a real job? How did that work? Well, in 98, 99, you know, no one knew how to make websites. Well, a very small percentage of people knew how to make websites. So it just started coming up. Like people were like, oh, you know how to make websites? Can you make me one? And I was like, yes, I can. I, I love to do it. So I started building websites for people, which was great. Uh, so I was doing quite a bit of freelance, getting paid to do what I love to do. And then when I graduated, actually, even before I graduated, I started working on a uh, research project at the U of A. And my job was just to be the, the computer guy on the project. And so I built built a website for the project. I built web-based databases with uh, MySQL and PHP that allowed all the researchers on the project to access the data. So I built this interface where they could query the data. And I built like, a very specific query engine where you could kind of select the thing. So they, what they did is they studied ancient cemeteries in Siberia. And so they would want to like connect all of the cemeteries together and, and look for patterns. So you could run a query on the system, like show me all the cemeteries that had nephrite rings and, you know, females or something. And then you could look for these patterns and, and it would show you them on a map as well. It would map them out. So I built that and that was uh, sort of like my first web application. That's kind of what mm -hmm. I went into that. But then eventually all the freelance work started picking up and in 2005, I thought, well, there's enough people that want me to build websites for them that I could just turn that into my job. So I stopped working for someone else and I started WhiteSpark. Nice. So you started WhiteSpark and it was really just a, a web development agency, it sounds like. And that's sort of getting us to the point where you were taking on clients and really working on some projects and everything. And, and then it sounds like Moz was one, became one of your clients during that process. Moz wasn't a client. No, I was just kind of obsessed with the Moz community and I was really I busy okay. with learning everything I could on the Moz website, really, yeah, yeah. and other websites, of course. Yeah. What turned you on to SEO then? Was it that somebody asked you for that or that you sort of just were interested in it yourself or what turned you on to that community? Yeah, it was exactly that. And I think a lot of people that were doing web development in the early 2000s would get that question from their clients to be like, hey, you know, we've got this website. How do we get it ranking in Google? I noticed my competitors come up when I type in my keyword, right? And so that question kept coming up. And so, of course, I would get into the basics of SEO and I would optimize the site and, and that would make a difference. And, and then, you know, you learn about 
more of the offsite stuff like link building and that kind of stuff. So I just started getting into it because my clients were asking for it. So I worked, uh, I worked pretty hard to get a lot of my clients ranking. And it was really when, when we launched the local citation finder in 2010, that there was a, a real shift, like from doing client work to building web applications that we would sell on a monthly subscription. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that piece. So you, you're going through this process, you're, you're making websites for people, they determine they need rankings in order to, to do well, you're implementing a lot of the SEO stuff. And then how did you get into the local piece of it then and into looking at citations? Was that because you had clients lined up there? Or is it a specific client? How did you recognize that opportunity? Yeah, well, all my clients were kind of local clients, right? So they were all trying to rank for local terms. So that was really what I was doing. And then after we launched the local citation finder, I, I just decided I want to learn everything that I possibly can about local SEO. And so I, I read everything that I could find on the topic, you know, everything from uh, David Mann, Mike Blumenthal, Andrew Shotland. I was just really obsessed with it. And so that's when I just I really, really got into it was after launching the local citation finder and I guess decided to become expert in the topic. Yeah. So let's talk about, I mean, a lot of the listeners here may not even know what local SEO is. So in your own terms, how would you describe what local SEO is and what the breakthrough was in order to recognize that there's a need for it? Well, local SEO, uh, I guess you would look at it as, you know, if you type in a city-based term like Edmonton plumbers or Minneapolis lawyers, you know, you'll get the local pack. And so the question is, like, how do you rank in that local pack? And it, it's basically the same as organic SEO. You know, you have to have a good website. It's well optimized, good content. You have to have good links. And so that's, you know, organic SEO. But it has all these other things like you have to have citations. So citations are your business listings on the web, you know, on yellow pages, Yelp, that kind of stuff. You have to have those accurate, optimized and you have to optimize your Google Plus page. So your Google Plus page should be, well, maybe we don't even call it a Google Plus page anymore. We're going to start calling it a Google Maps page as they divorce themselves from Google Plus. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that your listing at Google is well optimized and reviewed. So it's kind of like regular SEO with a few, you know, local specific things that you'll want to do on your website. And then those three additional things. So that's kind of yeah. what local SEO is. And then when you tie all the things properly together, you start ranking in the local results. Yeah. So it's basically geared towards businesses that have some kind of physical presence and helping them be the answer on Google for a query around your area. So Yeah. yeah you know, and a lot of people think that they'll have these businesses. Let's say, for example, it's a national business that helps people find assisted living facilities, right? They mm -hmm. think, oh, I want to rank in every single city. I want to rank for assisted living facilities. But they can't because they don't have physical locations in all of those cities. So that comes up all the time. They think that they want local SEO, but they don't. They want traditional organic SEO. Yeah. And so local SEO is the art and science behind getting that to happen and, and just sort of reverse engineering the process to know what Google considers to be important for getting your business address to show up in search results. Correct. We need to explain what citations are as well, because I don't know if everybody knows what that is either. So basically, one of the factors that makes your local business show up in these maps is the number of other websites or people who are talking about this website or, or who link to their physical address or their phone number, all that type of stuff. Yeah, so a citation is your name, address, and phone number somewhere on the web. That's the simplest definition of it. Like a reference to your business's physical location. Yep. Typically, you're going to see those on sites like Yellow Pages, Yelp, Super Pages, these business listing type sites. So those would be called structured citations. But you can also get unstructured citations. Like, for example, let's say you are a hotel and you hold events at your hotel and you get mentioned on blog sites and event sites and that kind of wedding sites. Right. Those citations come up. Those are called unstructured citations so or media mentions those would be unstructured citations so mm -hmm. you don't need a link it can just be the mention of the name address phone number and that's what google considers a citation and uh, those contribute to your rankings in the local packs yeah so when you were going through this process and you were doing this making other people's sites show up in these results did you realize that the need for citations was it that it was really hard to find them was it that there wasn't a great repository available or was it that you just thought that was a differentiator for you? What made you decide that was the thing that you wanted to focus on? Well, it was really because I read this. So I knew about citations and I knew that it was important to get my clients ranking in the local packs. 
And I had read this article from Garrett French, and he talked about this method that you could use to query Google for uh, your competitor's phone numbers and then put it together in a spreadsheet and then query Google for your own phone numbers. And you could compare them and be like, hey, these are all the citations that my competitors have that I don't have. And so I read that article. And I thought, hey, we could build software that automates that process. And so we did. We built the local citation finder. And that's really the the basics of how it operates. Okay. And so that's when I was like, that's when I really got interested in citation tools and citation analysis was when I read that article, we built the first version of the tool, all the local search bloggers started blogging about it and uh, it just became popular. And then we made it much better than the first version and put a subscription model on it. Yeah. So basically the first one was solving a need that you had and you thought that others might have it too. And then eventually that became so popular and so important that it became a major focus of the business. Absolutely. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Like it was just kind of a, a lucky win because we were like, Hey, this would be great to have. And I didn't really think that it would turn into a business. I would just wanted to build it. Yeah. And that business is doing really well from what you've told me. How many customers do you have? How has it grown over the years? Yeah. So there are 50,000 plus registered accounts on the site. Lots of those are free, so that not all of those people are paying us. So it has a lot of attention. It's a major portion of White Sparks revenue, which pays uh, all the bills around here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's going well. I, the only thing I think about the local citation finders is that it hasn't really seen much, much enhancement since about 2011. So we've been very focused on our local rank tracking system, which is uh, undergoing a major overhaul right now. And it's just about to launch. And so when that launches, then I want to turn my attention back to the local citation finder. I have a a big, long to-do list of features and enhancements and improvements I want to make to that system. Mm -hmm. Great. So you've taken this citation finder and built out a whole series of tools around local search. And sort of that's become, you know, when, when I got introduced to you, when I met you, it was really focused on the local piece of search, right? And so that's your focus now. Yeah, absolutely. So we focus specifically on local search. And so we have the local citation finder, which is a citation analysis software. We have the local rank tracker, which will track your rankings in any city and and you can track rankings with or without the, the, the city keyword. So you don't have to say, you know, Minneapolis plumbers, you can just say plumbers and we'll show you where you rank in each city. We'll show you where you rank in the local pack, the organic results, the, uh, on Bing, Yahoo, etc. So mm-hmm. we have that. And then we also have a, a system to help you with reviews. It's called the reputation builder. And so the way that works is, you know, you uh, create an account and you put in your customer's information as they come in, or you can load up a list of your customers and it'll send them an email that just says, hey, how was your experience today? Please, you know, let us know. Let's get from one to 10. Anyone that gives you a seven or higher, it sends them to a page that says, great, we really appreciate it if you left us a review online, has links to the review sites. And anyone that left you a six or lower, it takes them to a page that says, thanks for your feedback. We'd really love to know how we could improve. What, what could we have done to improve your experience? So that way you kind of keep people that had negative experiences. You kind of keep the review off the web because you're, you're mm-hmm. capturing that in your own system. And people that had a positive experience, you're, you're sending them to the review site. So it really helps you to build more reviews. So those are the three yep. systems we have right now for software. We have a number of services as well. Mm-hmm. How do local business owners find you? How do they know that this is something they need? Because I think that a lot of them are, you know, marketing's the 10th thing that they need to do over the course of a given day. So they're not really maybe aware of these things. How do they find something like this? We don't do much marketing ourselves, just kind of inbound marketing. So we write articles and I think it's mostly that we just get mentioned all the time. So when people mention local SEO, so if you know someone's writing an article on Moz or someone's writing an article on Search Engine Land, we often get mentioned as as having software to help with all of these things. And so mm-hmm. I think that the small business owner, when they start thinking about this, they're like, oh, I need an SEO company or, or how do I do some of this myself? Our name frequently comes up and then it just sort of leads them to us and then they'll check out our website. And I think that's how it all happens. Yeah. So you're sort of, are you catering more to the DIY do it yourselfers or are you more to agencies or is it whoever can utilize it? I think it's a pretty balanced mix, actually. We have a lot of agencies, of course. They know about us and they they use our software. But then we have a lot of small businesses, too, that just do it themselves or they're medium-sized where they actually have a marketing person that takes care of it and then they use the software or or they'll use our services as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. How would somebody go about getting started? Like, What would be your recommended plan if somebody... So I'm I'm in Minnesota right now, 
recording this. And what would you do if you were like a restaurant in Minneapolis and you wanted to show up in any kind of search, maybe like in a certain neighborhood or something? How would they go about doing this? Would they, would it be something on their website? Would they just invest in a tool like yours? Would they do research? How would they go about this? There's a lot of boxes to check off on that on that to-do list. We actually have a really good blog post on our site. It's a local SEO for the small business owner short on time. And it kind of goes through all of the basics that you'd want to square away. So there's really five components to it. So you'd want to optimize your website and making sure that you have good content that really makes you relevant for the terms that you're targeting. That's not just like a few sentences that you have to have multiple paragraphs that sort of talk about your topics and the different services you provide. Then you want to optimize the title tags and the header tags and make sure you've got the city and stuff. You should have your name, address, and phone number on your website. Then it's your citations, which are your business listings. So you want to get listed on the top 50 most important sites in your country. Uh, We have a list on our site, the top citations by country. So you want to make sure that your business is uh, listed on all of those. You could do some competitive analysis with the local citation finder to find more citation opportunities that your competitors have that you don't. Those would be useful to get. You certainly want to start driving reviews. So you can use a software like what we have, the uh, Reputation Builder, or you it could just be as simple as, you know, you just start asking. If you're a mortgage broker and you only deal with like 10 clients a month kind of thing and you're closing those deals or even less, then you don't need the software. At the end of the job, you just send an email and say, hey, we'd really appreciate your feedback and here's a link to our review sites. That's always enough. So yeah. Um, asking for reviews is huge. You really want to get reviews coming in and you should get them coming in on a variety of sites. So it should be on your Google listing, your Facebook page or Yelp pages listing. I don't usually recommend asking for reviews on Yelp because unless the person has an active account and they're using Yelp all the time, that review will usually get filtered. So uh, it's kind of useless to just blanket ask people for a review on Yelp. Yeah. What percentage of business owners are doing this? It has to be a small percentage still. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I th- I would also agree that it's about a small percentage. I would say about, you know, 10% of businesses are, are really thinking about this and dealing with it. It really depends on the industry. Yep. So if you're talking about personal injury lawyers, 100% of them are concerned yep. with this. If you're talking about, you know, emergency locksmiths, 100% of them are worried about this. If you're talking about accountants, 5%, you know, yep. their business just doesn't run off the internet. They get leads from referrals and word of mouth and that kind of stuff. Same thing with something like engineers. You know, I know a number of engineers and they're like, yeah, we don't want leads from the web, even lawyers in some cases. So if you're a criminal or a personal injury lawyer, then you'll be into SEO and think about how do we get leads from the web. But a lot of sort of general practice law firms that I talk to, they don't even want leads from the web. They would prefer to not rank on the web because Generally, they get all of these like, hey, I would like to sue my cat because they ripped <laughs> my curtains, you know, just like crazy people coming out all the time. So they would prefer to not rank really well for general law terms. I've seen that a number of times. So mm-hmm. it really depends on the industry. Yeah. OK. And you think everybody could use this? I guess you just gave a lot of cases where people wouldn't want to do this. But I think that for the most part, a lot of businesses should be doing this and they probably can get some good returns if they just do basic optimization, especially in places that are underutilized areas that are that are not showing up very well right now yeah i think there's huge opportunity for a lot of businesses now back in 2008 2009 it was well even earlier it was the glory days for local search because there weren't very many people doing it so you could do the little basics and you could rank really well now i consider a lot of the traditional local seo tactics kind of table stakes like you square away your citations they're all accurate and you're listening on the right site You've got all the website optimization. You've got a lot of reviews coming in. That's, I consider, just like baseline. And then once you have that, it really moves into more organic SEO, which is trying to get media mentions and get links and and writing content that that people care about, like really good next level content. So local SEO is really starting to lean heavily on traditional SEO tactics and strategies. So especially in competitive markets. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's where things are starting to blend together again, right? And that is a lot of the things that we were able to do in the the heyday, like you say, in the 2000s, up until basically Google made their major updates to penalize people for low quality and for trying to gain the system. Now it's just creating something that people want to see and creating something that's compelling. And so a lot of it just comes down to good content and good overall marketing strategy, really, and executing on it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's interesting. So the marketing world, it seems like you've 
went through the process and sort of just found an area that was underserved and something that you were curious about that you were interested in. And, and that's really what forged your path is the wins that you had in a few different areas. And now you created this tool that's out there. Do you see this continuing on or is there other things that you want to branch out and to do? What do you have any ideas to what the future plans are here? Yeah, right now we're still very focused on local search. So um, there's still lots of opportunity there, huge growth potential. So we're certainly, I have a big overhaul plan for the local citation finder to take that to the next level. I have a couple of other tools in my back pocket that I'd like to build for the local search community. So we're going to keep pushing that out keep expanding our services as well. So we have three primary services. We have like a full local search service where we'll do everything for you, including the content creation, link building, squaring away all of your local search. So we have like a full, we could be your local search agency. We Mm -hmm. have a citation audit and cleanup service where we'll find citations that have the wrong phone number or wrong business name around the web. And we get all those fixed up and make sure that you have one accurate listing on all the important sites. And then we have a straight citation building service where you just submit and we look at where all the places where you are listed and the places where you're not. And we just go out and submit your business to all of those sites. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just keep building in local search and more services and more tools and just improving our tools. And and I'd like to bring all of our our software into a suite. So you'll still be able to get them one off, but you'll be able to subscribe to the suite as well. So that's another change I'd like to make in 2016. Nice. And so how big is the team that you have in place right now? Yeah, so we have three software developers. We have a marketing manager, Jesse. We have one customer service rep. We have Nyongaslav. He runs the citation audit and cleanup team. And he's got uh, four people working for him. Then we have our local Spark team. That's our local search service. And that's uh, that's a partnership with Phil Rosick and I. And we have three guys working on that side. And then there's the citation building team, which is uh, about 14 people that run that team so yeah wow nice so you've expanded and really sort of developed a mini local empire <laughs> which yeah, is sort of cool to see. and do you do this for companies just in the u.s and canada or do you do it elsewhere as well yeah we have international companies that we do citation work in dozens of different countries so we'll do it anywhere mostly as long as the only problem we run into sometimes is language barrier so mm-hmm. uh, we haven't done any asian countries well i should i think we're working on malaysia right now but we have someone that can help us with that But yeah, most countries, our software works in like the local citation finder works across 38 different countries. The local rank tracking system, the current version works in just just the uh, the common English speaking countries. But we're expanding that on the new version we're about to launch. And then services, mostly English speaking countries. So, uh, you know, U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, Mm -hmm. that's typically the bulk of our business. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Okay. I've known about local SEO for quite some time, but I like to see the depth behind it. And also, I hope this has really helped for the listeners to know that because a lot of people either are involved with a local business or have family or friends who are into a local business. So hopefully those are some really useful tips there. You said that you learned this originally by sort of just joining the Moz community and, and sort of surrounding yourself with that and learning everything and reading everything you could. How do you continue to learn? How do you stay current with what's going on here? So... Uh, There's a number of ways. Twitter's been really good. So Twitter was kind of like my way to get information for a long time. I follow all of the local search blogs. So I read everything that uh, Mike Blumenthal puts out, that Phil Rosick writes, Yagoslav, all the stuff that he he was writing. So I stay on top of everything that's being written. There's a few really good communities. So uh, there's the Local U Forum. Um, That's a paid forum. So that's a great place to get involved. There is a local search community on Google Plus run by Max Menzer and Bill Rosick. So that is a great place to sort of stay up on what's new in local search. And then there's Linda Biquette's forum. I think it's just localsearchforum.com, which is a fantastic place to get all the latest news and you know people talking about very specific problems. So every day I spend a little bit of time in all of those places. And we actually just built something which I'm really excited about. I call it the White Spark Local Pulse. And so it's a, what I've done is I've aggregated the 38 different local search blogs into one RSS feed. And then I run that through MailChimp. And then every day it sends me an email and it says, these are the latest local search uh, posts that came out. So that's really helpful for me to, to never miss any local search posts. So I read pretty much everything that comes out. And so that local pulse email, I want to release that to the public and let other people sign up for it as well. Awesome. I'll link to that in the show notes so people can see that. And if they're interested in, in getting up to date and just seeing what's going on, well, you know, right. take your curated list and, and put it in there. 
Great. And so some more questions for you. Um, where do you see this going in the future from a local standpoint? I know that you said that there's still a lot of room for businesses to really to focus on this, but do you see it merging with the overall marketing piece? Is it still going to be its own little area? Do you see local marketing getting to be as sophisticated as some of the marketing that happens within bigger businesses or e-commerce businesses, lead gen, that type of stuff? Yeah, it's already happening. So, you know, in our local search service, we started our local search service where we just mostly did the foundational local SEO. And, you know, depending on our clients, we'd find that we didn't get great results. So you have to start really doing that next level stuff, like writing a content piece that will get picked up by Mashable. Like that's the kind of stuff you need to do. And then that'll really put you on a local map or, or doing outreach in your local community. So you write a great piece of content about events in the area and then you reach out to local media and local bloggers and you get them to mention it. And so all of that can really help. Or doing business partnerships with other sort of similar businesses to make sure that they're mentioning you and linking to you. You, you can't just do the basics. You have to really get into and to content and link prospecting and link outreach mm -hmm. in order to rank well now. So that's really changing. And then another thing that's going to start to see shifting, and we see that this in San Francisco already, Google is piloting paid local search results. So they have this like service thing. So if you search for a plumber San Francisco, all of those results are paid. And so this is interesting because in the local space, we see the writing on the wall that, well, Google start rolling this up for many different industries. And so... You know, the question is whether or not traditional local SEO will even exist anymore if it all yeah. becomes paid, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Curious. That's really interesting. That's scary, too. I mean, because a lot of the things that we're talking about here are based on, you know, really just being a better marketer. And that's what you're talking about, the things around getting mentioned, getting people to talk about you, all those things. These are things that business owners have been trying to do forever, right? That's really just marketing and PR right. 101. It's to get your brand out there and to put, you know, putting your logo on a truck, putting it, your phone number on something. It's basically just putting yourself out there and making everything about your business. And it seems like that's really what we need to do in order to, to thrive in this area, especially in competitive areas where there's all kinds of different competition going on. Right. But at the same time, that's going to be important. But at the same time, it sounds like you're, there's a potential conflict with pay to play, paying your way to the top. And, we, and we've seen that happen quite a bit with the organic search world with Google is just the number of ads that are showing up in, in, or in search results are, are off the charts. And so I think that uh, the paid stuff will, there'll always be room for the organic stuff. I think if, like, imagine if Google search results were 100% paid, right? People stop trusting them. So, you know, Google can't do that. So there'll always be a lot of room for organic and local organic results. It's just, we see some shifting happening for sure. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, so a few more questions, and then we'll, we'll probably be at the end of our time. So I know this is an interesting question for you since you're in local search, but how has location factored into this? Was location, you being in, in Edmonton, did that really affect things at all, or was that a good thing or neutral in the overall process? I think it's kind of neutral in the overall process. I think the, the thing for me was just that I was building websites for local businesses, and so local search was the kind of search that I just happened to need to do for my clients. Yep. Like I had a hair salon client and the hair salon client really pushed me because they didn't really care about the blue links. They cared about the local pack. And at the time it was a 10 pack. So they were like, how do we get to the top of that pack? Because they, they yep. recognized that that's what everyone was looking at if they were searching for a hair salon. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just it was the type of clients I had that really pushed me to local. Yeah. It's funny because there was a time where I thought that I was going to be focusing heavily on local, but then the clients actually, they wanted something else. And so I sort of went into a different direction. And that, that sort of, you know, basically you, you sort of go where the people who are interested in what you have to say or, you know, where they are, where they, right. what they want to do. Yeah. And it seems like that took you down that path. So location, whether it was, you know, you, you, it sounds like you could, you could have done this from anywhere, but the fact that you're located where you are was, was a factor into this thing because that's how you got those clients. Right. Yeah. I think anyone doing web development in any city and that catered to a local market, you know, those people started thinking about local search. Yeah. Cool. Next question. What, and this is a tough one sometimes to answer, but what was the best piece of advice you received along the way while you're doing this, while you're building this out? Oh, I don't know. That is a tough one. I've gotten so much advice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well then how about this one? If you were to give advice for somebody getting into marketing who was looking to excel their career or to get further along, what would, what advice would you give them? 
I think maybe one of the biggest things that worked for me was getting involved in the community. So, you know, really being active on Twitter and being active on local search forums and the mods comments. That really was big for me just to sort of build relationships and friends in the industry. And, you know, so I think if you're the quiet type, that can hurt you. It's really valuable to build your relationships in the industry. I, and I think that this interview is a good example. Like I never would have met you. I never would have been doing this podcast if I wasn't the type of person that was just sort of putting myself out there and, and, and trying to get engaged in those conversations and then getting the opportunity to speak at conferences. Right. So I think it all builds that way. And that's been a huge, huge benefit to the business. Yeah. Do you think that people having good arm wrestling skills is a factor into it too, Darren? It's really good because you can <laughs> drum up a lot of uh, interest when you're, when you're good at arm wrestling. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, cool. I'll tell that story when we do the outro or when I do the <laughs> outro. But basically, Darren and I, we met last summer. And then within two hours of meeting, we challenged each other to an arm wrestling That's contest no for whatever happened. reason. And now it's become this thing of legend between us, uh, the arm wrestling battle. And, and I'll tell you who won in the show notes as well if you're curious about that. But yeah, I think that, you know, putting yourself out there and that's, that's always a tough thing though, because some people are naturally introverts and some people are naturally extroverts. So right. if you are somebody who's an extrovert, that's easy. You just go around and talk to people and approach them. I'm more of an introvert. I don't always appear that way anymore. I've started to got, I've gotten over my uncomfortableness, but the two tips that I have in that case is that one, it takes a lot of repetition. You need to go out and do it more often and then it becomes more natural for you, even if it isn't originally natural. The other right. thing is use the power of the internet to give yourself a easy buffer into meeting people. So people are on Twitter, you know, follow the hashtags for a conference and talk to them on Twitter. Leave comments on people's blog posts if you want to meet them. There's a lot of opportunities that if you want to meet people, there's a lot of opportunity because a lot of people that are in the internet marketing space, especially put themselves out there. That's sort of what we do. That's the nature of internet marketers is to put themselves out there. And so that's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity for you to meet other people who are there. And it doesn't have to be just going up and approaching them cold. In fact, that doesn't really work very well a lot of times because people don't really either know who you are or they just might not be sure of what's going on. They're introverts themselves. So it doesn't have to be just approaching people, but more than anything, it is joining that community that really gets that it gets the ideas flowing. It gets opportunities going. You talked about how sort of the idea for your local citation builder was basically because of the community. It was like the community wants this and I'm going to be the one to deliver it. And that's a really cool way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that even if you're, you're not the most outgoing person, you don't really feel great in like group situations and you're not the types of schmooze and, and chat with people. Most people that are like that can be very social on the internet. Like I know a lot of people that don't like to go to events, but they're very engaged in the various communities. And so the internet is kind of a great thing for introverts, I think, where you can still be a part of that community and, and build relationships without having to actually leave your office. Yep, absolutely. That's how I've gotten most of my relationships and then strengthen them in the in-person piece. And that's really a good way to go about things. Do you have any other advice for marketers or anything else you've picked up along the way that might be helpful? I think it is really important to read everything you know, you really have to stay on top of the publications and, and read as much as you can. I think that that was a big turning point for me where I just decided if anything has been written about local search, I want to read it. So uh, just making sure that you're on top of that has been really good for me, I think. Yep, absolutely. Read as much as you possibly can. And so I'll, I'll share that resource with the people or the resource you said, the local pulse for those who are interested. And you also gave me several other cool communities and links. And so for those of you who are interested in this area, we'll have lots of resources available for you to get caught up and to really understand what's going on here. And so with that, thanks so much for joining me today, Darren. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. It was fun. Yeah, it's great to have you. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see each other for another arm wrestling match in the near future. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Sounds good, man. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Hopefully you hit it off with Darren Shaw as much as I did. He's one of the good guys. Okay, it's time to tell the arm wrestling story. It all starts at the MN Search Summit 2014. I had a very small role in putting on the MN Search Summit. It was our first one, and I had spent several months leading up to it helping get things done, volunteering, do, doing all kinds of cool stuff. And once the final speaker was done, finished speaking, I was like, it's time to let my hair down. 
So we brought a lot of the event attendees and speakers to the rooftop at Brit's Pub in Minneapolis. It's a famous icon with outdoor lawn bowling, and, and it's really ideal for the Minnesota summer, which doesn't last very long, but when it is there, it's pretty awesome to be outside at lawn bowling. So at some point, we're all sitting on this patio at Brit's Pub, and a debate broke out about who would win in an arm wrestling contest. Now, I may have started this debate, may not, I'm not sure. All of a sudden, arm wrestling matches are breaking out all over Brit's lawn. And I may have been a participant, I may not have been a participant, I'm not sure. I can't really admit to that here. But there was a clear dominant figure emerging from the match, and his name was Jeff Liddix. With his dominance unquestioned, his charm unmatched, and his ego uncontrollable, Jeff Liddix was really the premier arm wrestler on that lawn that day. Until Darren Shaw stepped up to the plate for the match of the evening. So Darren and Jeff Lydix were sitting there, locked in arms, doing the arm wrestling thing. Darren's trying to go over the top like Sylvester Stallone, you know, just going after it. And for five minutes, this match went on. There was no winner. We were just going at it. And we soon realized that nobody was going to be the winner here. We were just like, you know, one person was pushing, the other person just absorbed it. And so um, we stopped. We took a, did a rematch maybe 30 minutes later, and there still was no winner. And so the night ended in a stalemate. And we decided we were going to have a rematch at some point, and we're going to start working out and doing arm exercises and all that good stuff. Uh, And we said, let's do a rematch at MozCon 2015. And so that match took place in in a Seattle bar, and there's a lot of anticipation surrounding the event. It was announced in social media, and there's all these people sitting there watching us, and I was sort of embarrassed by that. But when the dust cleared, the results were the same. Darren and Jeff ended the night in a tie. Here we remain, tied in eternity. One of us will need to get coaching or the weight room or something in order to get settled for once and all. But until then, the rival remains strong. And so that's how I became friends with Darren Shaw, and that's our arm wrestling story. It's pretty funny to watch two internet marketers really trying hard to act like they're stars of a 1980s arm wrestling movie. I did everything short of drinking motor oil like the guy does in Over the Top. You have to watch that movie to really get it, but Over the Top is probably the most over-the-top arm wrestling movie I've ever heard of. And so... That's it. That's my story about arm wrestling, and I've already gone on too long. So for show notes, visit jefflytics.com slash Darren. 